Well, good morning. Um, this is uh, the uh, third talk in our almost a uh, fellow um, grant round series here. Um, Dr. Ashark is going to finish up the uh, grant round series, and um, Yash is uh, the inaugural interventional uh, fellowship actually that started with two fellows. Dr. Gudetti was the second fellow. He um, joined us from the um, Mount Sinai system in New York and then interviewed for the structural heart disease position here. So he's also the first one who uh, moved on to a, a second year, which we had never done before. And then became the structural fellow, but also kind of a um, super fellow in the sense that by his peers, definitely regarded as the um, go-to person for questions with regards to maybe interventional questions, but also to kind of live questions and then how to handle, you know, certain situations. So it's really nice to hear that actually from the interventional fellows that a person who stayed on for two years and helped so much. Um, he's going to move on here very soon to the uh, Baylor University system in Texas. Um, I personally uh, feel it's very sad that we leave him. I think that uh, Yash has uh, absolutely set a new standard. Um, so whoever does this a second time really has to look up to, to Yash and, and make this the same way. Um, published a lot of papers with various um, authors here from interventional to structural. Um, and as I said, really acted as a, as a super fellow. So today he's going to tell us uh, some or teach us about some updates in TAB or for bicuspid aortic stenosis. So thanks for joining us, Yash. Good luck with uh, you and your family and, and your new life in Texas. And we're going to enjoy your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gessel. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, TAVR and bicuspid AS. Um, bicuspid AS still sometimes seems like a unicorn in the world of, uh, of TAVR, especially for a young operator like myself. So, you know, it's with the advent of low-risk TAVR uh, and how the CMS has approved that for patients above 65, I think our cath labs are going to see more patients with bicuspid AS uh, asking for TAVR. Um, so as of now, around 1% to 2% of our population has bicuspid aortic stenosis. Around 3 to 4% of them are coming to our lab for TAVR. And unfortunately, we don't have a dedicated randomized trial on TAVR versus SAVR in these patients. And I'm not sure if we'll ever get one. Um, we all know about the Sievers classifications so from his original paper about two decades ago. Um, Bicuspids are classified into zero, one, and two based on how many RAFE they have. So type zero is someone without RAFE. Type one is someone who has one RAFE. So he's born with uh, a bicuspid with either a left, right, right, non, or a combination of non and left fuse. And then type twos are more rare. And I've sort of kept that out uh, of this talk. And we'll elaborate more on type zeros and type ones. So I think we've sort of moved more towards this pragmatic classification, which is CT based and sort of dedicated for tower readers and tower operators, where we divide bicuspids into first two types. First is based on how many commissures were you born with. So in panel A, this is a, a 40 reconstruction CT. Um, try commercial RAFE type or functional or acquired bicuspids of patients who have were born with a tricuspid valve and over time two partially fused. And these are patients who are functional and acquired bicuspids and they're a completely different phenotype than patients who are true bicuspids. And by true bicuspids, I mean you were born with two commissurals. So, so you were born with a bicommissural type with or without a RAFE. So right in the center of the screen, we have bicommissural RAFE type, and these are your type ones. Depending on which of the coronary cusps or non-coronary cusps are fused, we uh, further subcategorize these patients as a coronary cusp fusion or a mixed cusp fusion. So coronary cusp fusion would be your type one with left and right fusion, and mixed cusps would be um, an either combination with the non. And then the bicommissural non-RAFE type, 
which has seen in around 20% of our patients, um, these are essentially your type zeros. Uh, rarer, but, uh, but not as rare as type two. So what's the big deal with TAVR and bicuspid? Why is it so different than your senile tricuspid AS uh, in an in a 85 year old? So I think challenges can be subcategorized into four categories. So number one, at the level of the annulus. So the bicuspid patients tend to have larger annuli, often elliptical annuli that increases the risk of paravalvular leak and poses a challenge with device selection because we only have a few sizes to choose from. Second thing is calcification. It's interesting because in these bicuspid patients, they tend to have bulkier calcification and the, the pattern of calcification is very different. Calcium is our enemy in the world of TAVR and calcium increases the risk of root injury, stroke and uh, permanent pacemaker requirement. I think the third thing that's a challenge is the RAFE. Presence of a RAFE, which is basically fusion of two cusps, uh, is a problem, especially when it's calcified. It poses a problem because the procedure can become unpredictable, the valves can be underexpanded, and there's a risk of injury to the aortic root. And then finally, aortopathy. A lot of these patients, um, essentially are born with weak tunica medias that increases the risk in the operating room. Um, they also have coexisting aortopathies like dilated ascending aortas or roots. Um, they also have horizontal aortas that make the procedures more challenging. So how are we planning our cases and how are we being pragmatic? So I think, uh, so first and foremost, how are we sizing? So, you know, we, so the annulus is sort of um, one of the most important tools we are using to size which prosthesis uh, we can use, either based on the area or the parameter. So I think this is a seminal paper uh, from Toulouse, uh, published in 2019, where the authors looked at around 150 patients with type 1 and type 0 bicuspid, and they said, you know, let's look at their CTs, um, and let's not only look at the annulus, but let's measure um, areas and perimeters at the level of the annulus, four millimeters above that, and then eight millimeters above the annulus. And then based on um, the anatomy, let's define um, what kind of anatomies we're dealing with. So what's interesting is in, bicus in some bicuspid aortic stenosis patients, they have something called as a tapered anatomy where uh, there is a narrowing four millimeters above the annulus at the level of the, the commissures, the intercommissural level. And this is often the point of maximum resistance. And, and we'll talk in further slides why this is important and why this can be uh, a substrate for, for root injury and valve under expansion. So again, it's more simplified slide. This is a volcano. Uh, the base could be considered the annulus. This is where we conventionally size uh, our tricuspid tavers, and we assume that you know, the annulus is where this valve will anchor. But in certain bicuspids, the anchoring doesn't happen at the annulus, but it happens four to six millimeters above the annulus at the level of the intercommissure. So it's important for us to know that this is a, a real problem. So again, this uh, seminal paper from Toulouse uh, called as the Bavard Registry. It was not randomized. It's a registry-based work that they did on type zeros and type ones. And based on measurements on CT at the level of the analyst and four millimeters above, which they've defined as the intercommissional level, they said, well, bicuspids can have three different types of sort of anatomies. One is a tube-like configuration, as you can see, where the analyst and the intercommissional levels are the same size. Another configuration is the flare configuration where it's narrow and then it gets larger as you go up. And then the third configuration, which is one to look out for and be wary of is the taper configuration where the annulus is broad, but the intercommissional level narrows down. And this can be a problem if you're choosing a valve based on the size of the annulus. So in this study, um, Again, around about 150 patients who looked in this registry, they had CTs pre and post TAVR. And we found, number one, the most common type of bicuspid is type 1 bicuspid. Uh, 
Number two, interestingly, above 80% of patients had a TAVR size just based on the analysts, and they did pretty well. Um, although it's important to note that most of the valves used here were second generation valves. Um, and number three, I think there's still a caveat where around 10 to 15% patients in this uh, registry uh, actually found the use of this intercommercial distance measurement useful, especially when you're uh, dealing with an anatomy that a, has a taper-like geometry. Um, the same concept was studied in a, a registry called as the Bivolutex registry, again, led by uh, some of the physicians from Toulouse. Uh, this was a, a registry that compared patients who underwent implantation of a new generation evolute prosthesis. So there were 78 patients who had uh, this valve implanted based on annular sizing, and then 73 actually had the valve implanted based on a combination of both annulus and intercommissural distance sizing. And there were no difference in outcomes um, in, in both these groups. So perhaps this intercommissural distance is probably more important when you are dealing with a balloon expandable valve that perhaps has more radial force than a, than a self-expanding valve. So the second problem that we're dealing with in, in a lot of these patients is just calcium. There's a tremendous amount of calcium everywhere. Um, again, tricuspid patients, senile, degenerative AS, these patients tend to calcify at either the tips or the base of their leaflets. And bicuspid patients, however, they tend to have more dense calcium right in the middle of their leaflet. Now, this can pose a problem for, like I said before, root injury. There's a risk of stroke because calcium chunks will embolize, and there's a real risk of coronary obstruction in these cases. Um, this was a, a paper from the Bicuspid AS Taver Registry, which is a multi-centered international registry. It's uh, led by some of the operators from Cedar sinai and they've shown various things in the past, and this is a Kaplan-Meier curve from one of their studies where they say that increase in calcification burden in bicuspids is associated with a real increase in all-cause mortality at two years. So you have a 19% all-cause mortality versus six when you're dealing with patients who have a tremendous burden of calcification. So the third thing that we'll talk about is the RAFE. Um, so um, why is the, this RAFE a big deal and, and why, why do we care about it so much? So I think just the present, again, this is from the same bicuspid AS TAVA registry, yes, the presence of a RAFE is usually bad. 13% um, patients had all-cause mortality at, seven, uh, at two years versus patients who did not have a RAFE. And I think this, this is sort of their hallmark uh, slide uh, per se. So based on CT planning, um, this group uh, looked at patients in this registry. There were around 1,100 patients. And they divided bicuspid phenotypes into three types. So first type was patients who did not have bulky leaflet calcification or a calcified raffle. Uh, second, which is in purple here. The second group was patients who had, also see it down here. Second group was in patients who had either of the two, either a calcified raffle or excess leaflet calcification. And then the last group was patients who had both a calcified RAFE and excess leaflet calcification. And what they found was over a two-year follow-up period, patients who, had, who were in the phenotype with both excess calcium and a calcified RAFE had an all-cause mortality of 26% at two-year follow-up. Um, as these patients in this, in this third sort of phenotype, they also had a higher risk of root injury a paravalvular leak with a TAVR valve and new pacemaker implantation. Now compare that with patients who either had no burden of calcification or had one of the highest features, their all-cause mortality was lower and comparable with actually are the well-known trials on low and intermediate risk TAVR patients. So perhaps taking on this last group of patients via TAVR may not be a good idea unless you really have to do it. Now, again, coming talking a little bit more about RAFE, why is knowing that this patient has 
uh, which type of type 1 bicuspid important. So what are the implications? So firstly, like I mentioned, type 1 with left and right fusion is the most common. Um, and as you can imagine, when you implant the valve, there will be a opposing force because of this raffe towards the non-coronary cusp when you're expanding the valve. And because of that, the, there's a higher risk of hard block and pacemaker requirement because the bundle of his just lies below the non-coronary cusp. What about patients who have type ones with left, non, or a combination of right and non-fusion? Now in these patients, it's important to know, as you can see here on these diagrams, that often their leaflet that's not fused is one of the coronary cusp leaflets, so left or right in this case. And having this leaflet calcified uh, can pose a risk of coronary obstruction because these leaflets tend to be longer and these leaflets are also heavily calcified. So again, something to keep in mind when we're planning uh, Tavers for these patients compared to our, our tricuspid um, patients. So this is a, a case example uh, from a, a case we've done here. So again, this patient is a type is an, a gentleman who had a high STS risk score, type one bicuspid. He has a calcified raffe with a left and right fusion, as you can see on his CT image on the left. Uh, he we decided to take him to the lab. Um, after joint decision making, we perform balloon valvuloplasty, which is sort of a practice for a lot of these patients, as you can see on the panel up here. And this allows us to A, crack the calcium and B, allow for um, placement of our tower valve appropriately. Uh, his sizing was appropriate for a 29 uh, S3 Ultra, which is a balloon expandable valve. Uh, we do like to deploy these valves higher in general, but specifically in these patients. And we did that, and actually he did very well, didn't have a stroke, no prior valvular leak, didn't need a pacemaker, and he went home. At one month follow-up, uh, he had a CT, fortunately, without any halt. But as you can see here, his, his valve frame is not quite circular. It's actually a little bit elliptical, and that's probably from... A um, little bit of constraining from this calcified raffia that he had. And again, this is a phenomenon that, that we're learning a lot, a lot more about. Um, this was another patient. This is another phenotype of type 1 bicuspid. So he's got left and right fusion, but it's not calcified. His overall calcification burden seems to be low. So this would be, uh, again, looking at that seminal paper, this is someone who probably would be at low to intermediate risk of a perioperative complication in the cath lab. So this patient, we opted for a self-expanding valve. So we used a appropriately sized 29 Evolute Pro, as you can see here. And final valve expansion was good. He had mild prior valvular leak, went home the next day, and his 30-day CT, in this case, he did not have a very high calcification burden. And you can see that in this case, his valve frame is more circular than spherical, which is what we like to see because deformation, as, as we've learned from uh, Dr. Lesser and Dr. Cavalcante, is often a nidus for halt. Um, and then what's the fourth challenge with these patients? The fourth challenge is aerotopathy, and it comes in various different colors and flavors. Um, so, you know, knowing what type of bicuspid you're dealing with is important because it plays a role in what kind of phenotypic aerotopathy they're going to have. So historically, type A's tend to have more ascending aortic dilations. Type 1's with left and right fusions tend to have uh, root dilations and are associated with coarctation. Type 1's with right and non-fusion have um, root sparing uh, aerotopathies, and they also have associated mitral valve disease. And then type 2s, along with type 1s with left and non-fusion, often have diffuse aerotopathy. Again, this is important when you're making decisions of whether sending this patient down for a percutaneous option or a surgical option. I think it's important uh, for us to know. I think this question comes up a lot, and I don't have a good answer, and neither is there good data and literature. Uh, but... Um, any bicuspid patient, once you treat the valve, what happens to their aerotopathy? What's their natural history of progression? Does it stop because you've taken away uh, the diseased valve? And uh, probably not from some observational data. Uh, so this is a very old paper that basically suggests that 
patients who've undergone aortic valve replacements, once they were followed up, usually at around five years, you'll start noticing that they'll have aortic problems such as dissection, especially when they had aortic dilations more than four um, centimeters. And this was an example of a patient who had a type 1 bicuspid. I'm sorry, you can't see the fusion very well here. And he also had a dilated um, ascending aorta, and he was actually referred for, for surgery. Um, this was a, a pretty memorable case from my fellowship. So this was a, a patient, frail 82-year-old, who was intermediate to high risk for surgery. Um, she had a type 1 bicuspid. So interestingly, she was type 1. I'm sorry, you don't see the raffia here very well, but she had a left-to-right fusion. And then, in, in like I mentioned, the non cusp in this case was larger and asymmetrically calcified. So we'd made a decision to actually do uh, the procedure under general anesthesia and TE guidance up front, which is not common for us uh, as we've moved away from that. Um, so we took this patient to the cath lab with the intention that we'll give her her tower valve, which will be a balloon expandable valve, the sapient platform. So sequentially, we'll start here. So uh, she's intubated, she has a TE probe down, we've crossed the valve, and then we perform balloon valvuloplasty, like, which I mentioned is a practice and that we often do in bicuspid patients. And as you can see here, there's a big chunk of calcium that everts, and it comes in close contact with the uh, sinus of Valsalva here. Once we saw this, uh, we decided that, you know, we'll probably not do her justice and may risk her uh, having aortic root injury by using a balloon expandable valve, which will have a very high radial force. So instead, we called our colleagues from Medtronic, and, and they came over and prepared a, a self-expanding valve, which is a Evolute valve for us. Um, we went ahead with the procedure with the Evolute valve. Unfortunately, the nose cone um, interacted with the arch and the patient had an acute aortic syndrome. She was in shock on the table. And I don't have pictures, but there was a contained perforation of her aorta here, which had to be urgently repaired by our vascular colleagues using an endoprosthesis. And then finally, we were able to implant um, an Evolute valve. She went home on post-op day three, and I saw her in six weeks follow-up, and, and she's doing very well. But again, I think this highlights two things. Uh, one is that in the absence of obvious aerotopathy, remember these patients still have weak tunica medias, and they are predisposed to injury perioperatively. And then the second thing is, um, you know, again, this, this calcification pattern that's seen in bicuspids is so different that it's, it, it should increase our level of caution awareness when we're planning such cases. Now, what about what data is out there? So like I mentioned, um, CMS um, has approved, or sorry, the FDA has approved TAVR for patients with bicuspid AS based on registry data. So it's unlikely that we'll ever have a randomized trial. I'm not sure, but it's unlikely. But I'm going to go over some of the seminal um, registry and uh, larger registry data that we have in the last couple of years. So this paper was from the TVT registry. It came out from Cedar sinai uh, This was basically 2,700 patients with bicuspid AS who underwent TAVR with a balloon expandable valve. And what we found was even though there was no difference in all-cause mortality in these patients, patients with bicuspid AS had significantly higher strokes, had significantly higher rates of pacemaker implantations and uh, conversion to open heart surgery at one year. Um, what about old versus new generation valves? So again, new generation valves tend to outperform our older generation valves, which were the, the first generation Sapien XT and core valve. The newer generation valves tend to have less paravalvular leak, lower risk of conversion to open heart surgery, and lower need for a second valve uh, to be implanted. Um, what about low risk patients? And as I mentioned, you know, we will probably be seeing more and more low risk patients in the lab. So do we have any data? And the answer is yes. So this was the same registry on 3,000 bicuspid patients from the TVT registry. And 
Here, basically, patients with a low STS score, so an average STS score of 1.7, uh, underwent TAVR uh, with a balloon expandable platform. And they, really, there was no difference in outcomes with bicuspids or tricuspid patients uh, in sort of the main procedural outcomes that we look at, such as stroke, mortality, need for pacemaker, or urgent surgery. Um, what about the Evolute valve? Um, so the Evolute valve, there is also data on the self-expanding valve platform in these patients. So this similarly was a study led by Dr. Forrest from Yale. Um, using the TVT registry, they looked at around 900 bicuspid patients who underwent uh, implantation with an Evolute R, which is probably a second generation Evolute valve or an Evolute Pro, which is a third generation valve. And they found that Bicuspid patients and tricuspid patients did well uh, in terms of the procedural outcomes, mortality, paravalvular leak. And one thing it's important to note is, and I haven't shown it here, is that the newer generation valves outperform the older generation valves in terms of risk of PVL, which is essentially what they were designed to do. And what about last or this year? Uh, we, we have some more data. Unfortunately, all registry data. So this is a uh, bicuspid versus tricuspid study in patients who uh, were low risk. And, and this was essentially a, a propensity match study comparing patients who were enrolled in a single arm evolute low risk bicuspid study. And they were compared to 150 tricuspid patients who underwent um, the evolute valve implantation as a part of the evolute low risk trial. Uh, patients in both arms did very well in terms of stroke, death, need for surgery. Uh, they had an equivalent risk of pacemaker, even though numerically higher risk of pacemaker in, in the bicuspid arm compared to the tricuspid arm. And then finally, what about the balloon expandable, the new balloon expandable, the, the S3's, uh, S3 platform? How did that compare with in bicuspid and tricuspid? So we all know about the PARTNER 3 trial. So the PARTNER 3 trial also had a bicuspid registry arm, which was essentially just enrolling patients in a, in a, a, without a comparator back when the trial was running. So in this paper, what the authors did was they did a propensity matched analysis comparing patients who underwent uh, a TAVR with a balloon expandable valve in bicuspid patients. And they compared that with uh, patients from the PARTNER 3 low risk trial. And we looked at outcomes, and outcomes were actually quite similar, again, in terms of stroke, death, um, all-cause mortality, and pacemaker requirements were also low. They were less than 10%. One caveat here is uh, in this bicuspid arm, patients who had extensive calcification in their RAFE or, or in their LVOT were actually excluded from the trial. What about TAVR versus SAVR? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a randomized trial. The largest sort of observational study that we have came from Cleveland Clinic, and this is it. It was published a few years ago. Uh, this was done using Medicare data. And in essence, both TAVR and SAVR performed well in patients in terms of mortality, stroke, heart failure. TAVR patients tended to have a higher risk of pacemaker requirement, whereas SAVR patients had a higher risk of renal failure and, and AFib. Again, you know, this is observational data, and there's definitely biases, and, and there's no CT data to, to understand what kind of patients they had taken up for TAVRs or SAVRs, which we've learned is probably the most important. What about type zeros versus type one? So again, all, there's no data out there. I think there's very weak data in the observational form where type zero patients tend to have a higher risk of coronary obstruction or elevated mean gradients, essentially because as I mentioned, they have more elliptical annuli, um, thus predisposing them to valve deformation or under expansion, halt, uh, increased gradients. Um, that being said, you know, we haven't shied away from doing TAVR and type 0 bicuspids either. So this was a gentleman in his 80s. Um, he was a type 0 bicuspid. 
uh, he had a history of ascending aortic uh, replacement and he did not want to undergo another sternotomy. So this patient, as you can see on the upper left here, is type zero with uh, a fusion of right and non-cusps, not very calcified. Um, so we performed an appropriately sized um, balloon expandable prosthesis, which was a 26 uh, ultra. Again, we implant slightly higher in these cases, which we did in this case, and he did well, no paravalvular leak. He didn't get a pacemaker and he actually went home the next day and, and he's doing very well um, at his six month follow-up. What about putting it all together? So, so it's, it's a complex problem, but and I think we have to be pragmatic when we're dealing with it. Um, all these patients should get a CT. We need to make sure uh, we evaluate them for things that can cause problems during the procedure or things that can cause problems with, with prosthesis um, performance, which would be calcification in their LVOTs, uh, in their leaflet, calcified raphes, type zero bicuspids, and then issues with aortopathy. I think if you're seeing these high-risk features, probably send them down the surgical route. Uh, if surgery is at high risk or prohibitive, uh, patients have to be counseled about um, the risk of res residual paravalvular leak, stroke, root injury, or permanent pacemaker implantation uh, with a TAVR if they're at very high risk of surgery. And I think if you're not seeing these high-risk features and perhaps TAVR can be done, uh, I think we still stick to sizing based on the annulus, probably except for patients who have this taper anatomy. Um, so I think we have to be pragmatic about analyzing not only measurements at the level of the aortic annulus, but four millimeters above that. And I think more so that applies for your balloon expandable valves uh, versus your self-expandable valves, um, who, which are at a higher risk of root injury, uh, given their higher radial force when they're implanted. And then I'm coming to my last couple of slides here. What about a lifetime plan? So I think this is very important. I think before our patients come to the lab, they have to have a lifetime plan uh, because most often their prosthesis, they will outlive their prosthesis. So, so I think there are two sets of patients that we're going to be dealing with. One is a patient who's above 65, robust, relatively healthy, but below 80. And then the other group of patients would be patients who are above 80. Now, this does not specifically apply to bicuspids. I think this applies to all our TAVA patients or all patients with AS. So I think if someone is, is coming to you and he's in his 80s, uh, he'll probably need one or two interventions in his lifetime. Um, and I think the two pathways could be uh, it's either SAVR first, followed by a TAV and SAV if his SAVR fails, or you go down the TAVR route, and you do a TAVR first, fo followed by a TAV and TAV once his first TAVR fails. Now, remember, two layers of valves still increase the risk of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, and there's a risk of coronary obstruction. Um, but probably in his ninth decade of life, that would be okay. And then patient B phenotype is someone who's above 65, less than 80. He's probably going to live for at least three decades, may have two to three interventions. So the question is, what do you do in these cases? So I think um, option A is you take them down the SAVR route. Once the SAVR valve fails, their second intervention could be a TAVR and SAVR. And once that fails, you know, you're sort of stuck because now the patients are probably close to 90. And now do you offer a redo SAVR or do you do a TAV and TAV and SAV, which has been done uh, with some risks involved. And then the other option is if this younger patient prefers to go down a TAVR route, we offer a TAVR first, then the second intervention could could possibly be surgery, and then his third intervention could be TAV and SAV. Now, this seems like a good option because here you have three procedures, but just one sternotomy. Um, and the alternative here could be he has a TAVR first, followed by a TAV and TAV, and his third surgery could be a redo SAV. So I still think perhaps this pathway may be a more reasonable pathway, if feasible. Again, not everyone can get a TAVR. 
uh, there's some anatomies that we do shy away from. Um, and I, I think just to add in bicuspid patients, we need to keep in mind that they have aortopathies and they may need one or two interventions in their lifetime for aortopathy. So that has to be factored in here in, in this complex uh, algorithm as well. And then finally, this is my last slide. I think we forget to do this and we don't do it uh, as often in, in the valve clinic. I think every bicuspid should have a first degree relative screen with an echo. I think every bicuspid patient needs to have his aortic sinus root ascending aorta looked at either through an echo or a CT or an MR. We must rule out a co-op, especially in patients with type one with left and right fusion. And then finally, you know, we see a lot of these patients who've had successful TAVRs and SAVRs, but that doesn't mean that their risk of root enlargement has gone. You know, there is still weak data to say that their roots or ascending aortas will continue to dilate independent of valve replacement. Uh, and these patients still need to be continued. The guidelines say um, if it's more than four at the time of surgery, they still need periodic uh, monitoring. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'll uh, take any questions uh, you guys may have. Thank you, Yash. I, I was able to <clears throat> join for the last couple of minutes too. I think that your slide with regards to um, the lifetime management is, is interesting. And um, I think when the foundation started the paper, we actually wrote a paper about that that is not in PubMed, but we asked a bunch of people to comment on lifetime management. And now it becomes it's almost 10 years ago, whenever we did that, I don't know, it's not six, six years ago, six years ago, maybe. Uh, but um, it's becoming an, a more interesting issue now, uh, more and more. Now, if you um, say 80 years, of course, maybe I would say, based on the survival data, um, um, those folks um, the, the likelihood that they need a second intervention is maybe a little lower, um, but I totally agree with the 65 to 80 year olds. And then I think my question would be, um, if I don't know if a surgeon is in the room or online, um, how, you know, the experience is in a, you know, very calcified, slightly enlarged route, and you have one of those valves expandable or a balloon expandable, self-expandable, in that route and you need a surgery because you know options are failing, how easy is it actually to operate on a, a bicuspid patient? That would be you know, my question. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see any surgeons here, but um, the little I know from the explant tower registry, um, I think it's very challenging to explant a self-expanding valve. The frames are taller and they interact with the ascending aorta. And often putting those patients through surgery means not only an AVR, but also probably a root. Uh, you may also traumatize the ascending aorta. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's not a benign operation uh, in, in some circumstances. Dr. Lesser. Yeah. Looking at this, there is a low frequency but very important group where a lot of specifics are involved with the risk of the procedure and that individual. And it looks to me, you tell me, how, that you're going to have to be able to read the CT and review this in some depth, maybe more than the reader himself. Now, how did you go about this and how do you see this playing out in the country? Yeah, I think I think that's a very good question. I think they are a I think, so I think the problem is that we tend to use our prosthesis, which were designed and studied in tricuspid patients, and we think they'll perform well in bicuspids. And I think, um, for example, the, the IFUs for the sapient device say that you can expand the valve up to 20% of what the nominal uh, area is. But in the Bavard registry that came out of Toulouse, they were very cautious. They did not expand any valve beyond three or 4%. So I think that is something we don't know about. And I think the second thing is, I think we have to be very pragmatic about each valve, each patient and have sort of shared decision-making about you know, which way we want to go. Um, there is 
no or very little data on, for example, type zero bicuspids. Um, there was data from the TAV uh, registry on bicuspid patients that, you know, basically talked about there being success because there wasn't a RAFE, but it's it was again not very well powered. So I think it's it's going to be a challenge. I think um, we're going to heavily rely on CTs to plan every aspect of the device selection uh, and device planning. How do you manage it, or how does an interventionist who can't read who doesn't read this? Uh, so how would it's going yeah, to be important. I see. There's a lot of transfers of information. Yeah. And there are a lot of very specific issues in, in a small group of people, but it matters. Yeah. So, how did you figure out how to do this? And how would you recommend that happen? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. I think, um, so I think, first of all, I, I think we heavily rely on your reports. Uh, so I think if we do mention, or if if we are evaluating not only the analyst by the but the intercommissural uh, distance as well, and defining at least in the report, this patient has a tube configuration, this patient has a taper configuration, or this patient has a flare configuration. I think that will be a good reminder to the operator. Hey, listen, if you're dealing with taper and you're putting in a balloon expandable valve, just size down. Don't put a 26 apn. Maybe put a 23. Number one, and I think number two, uh, I wonder if, you know, looking at certain patterns, if if you can comment on proceed with, you know, TAVR with caution or proceed with TAVR with a pre-balloon valvuloplasty or, or consider surgical consultation in, in certain patients who have these sort of high-risk phenotypes. I'm not sure, did I, did I answer your question? Well, I just know you're a very good reader of these <laughs> things, but... You're, you're young and this is new technology and you're new. Yeah. How, how would you, so, so you're helping us as readers help someone else who doesn't use this yeah. in the same way. Yeah. But do you think it's necessary to be fluent with this technology in order to be an interventionist? I think definitely. I think not only now that I've done my structural year, you know, I look at things that we were doing last year and, and I wonder how we had the courage to do them without knowing a CT beforehand, you know, putting a 14 French impella or going for a high risk PCI and struggling because we thought we could go down the radial only to know we had so many loops. So I think CT is the future and I think it will be integrated with both the interventional and structural fellowship perhaps in a decade from now. Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, you know, as I, as I recall, you're showing the capital Myers survival curve that were extensively calcified patients. Um, they seem to continue to separate well after the procedure. And I'm wondering why that might be, because it seems to me that most of the risk would be at the time of the procedure. And, and I'm just wondering why afterwards. They, yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So I think, I think the main reason, or one of the main reasons, is probably paravalvular leak. Um, so you know, in these patients who uh, have bulky calcium, they have calcified raphes, valves will not expand, and valves will not behave like the way we want them to behave. So I think there are probably two reasons. One would be your valve frame is underexpanded. So there's a leak. Now you can tolerate a mild, moderate leak for a few years, but can you tolerate a moderate leak at four, five, six years? Probably not. And I think the second thing is, which was shown in an example uh, here where we had actually done a, a, a high risk uh, type one bicuspid. And as you can see, as follow-up CT, it's not circular. I mean, the goal in most of these prostheses is they should be circular, but it's oval here, it's elliptical. And, you know, we've learned from uh, Dr. Cavalcante and Dr. Lesser here that this is a nidus for possibly halt and possibly early valve degeneration. And when your valves degenerate early, I think that's associated with lower EFs, heart failure, and that definitely increases your risk of all-cause mortality on follow-up. Uh, but, you know, I think with the newer generation valves, so the, court, the fourth generation Sapien or the third generation Evolute, which we're implanting now, they have an extra skirt um, that has more 50% more contact with the structures in the, the aortic root. Uh, 
and and we are seeing less PVL in a lot of these patients now. Um, definitely, yeah. Dr. Galgante. It's a great overview. You left no stone unturned. Thank you. you covered everything. Um, I wanted to make a, a quick comment uh, just on, you know, obviously, as you highlighted, there's going to be really difficulty to lead into a randomized controlled trial, right? And uh, they're, they're by cuspids and by cuspids. And those that make it to the registry that receive power obviously are selected by cuspid patients. So, accepting that, you know, you have a comparable result. Um, my question to you is in regards to induction abnormalities um, and any um, data that you could uh, highlight because it seems that uh, pacemaker rates are slightly higher with bicuspid than uh, tricuspid um, you know, by you know, the younger population for bicuspid. Any sites that you have come across that uh, might be important to highlight? Sure. So I think um, so. I think two things I can I can comment on here. I think number one is you know when we're looking at the geometry of type one bicuspids, um, especially when you have a left and right fusion, and let's say this rafe is now calcified, you're going to have this counter coup force when you're implanting your valve, and you will be pushed to that side whether you like it or not. And I think that even though we try our best now, you know. Implanting valves now compared to three, four years ago, we're implanting valves very high, but I think still we would increase our risk of pacemaker. So I think probably in type one bicuspids, which are probably the most common type of bicuspids undergoing TAVR, and I think most of the registries, you know, would have 60, 70, 80% type ones. I think out of those also, you know, a majority of the type ones are left and right. That's the phenotype. And I think that is probably one reason why and uh, they have a higher risk of pacemaker implantation. And I think the second thing is um, patients who uh, are undergoing implantation with a, with a self-expanding valve. Again, I think there is some registry data, some meta-analysis that say that these patients are also at a slightly higher risk of pacemaker. And, you know, we see that even with the most recent uh, registry papers from this year, these propensity match studies, you know, even though there was no difference, you know, almost 20% of patients walked away with a, with a, with a pacemaker and, and they were low risk uh, bicuspids, uh, whereas the same cohort, slightly, probably slightly more selected cohort, only had a 6 to 7% pacemaker implantation rate with the, with the balloon expandable valve. So I think these are probably two variables um which could explain why we're seeing more pacemaker uh, in these patients i think it's also important to always go back to the exclusion criteria for the the few trials that we have done we participated in the low risk um, medtronic <clears throat> and i believe that the aorta couldn't be more than 40 um in those so um, you know, when the outcome data are, are showing you something and then it is applied to the general population, I think it's very important to go back and say, okay, what was actually excluded? You know, they excluded a bunch of things uh, to implant a bicuspid valve. So, and then okay. the second thing, um, <clears throat> and, and we always forget about that, right? Once it's approved, we just implant it in everybody. Same thing for other things too. But the, um, the other thing is also, if you look at your data, right, there's sometimes pacemaker rates of 20%, stroke rates of 5 to 8%. I mean, it's all over the place where if you report in the, debit, in the TVT registry, if your stroke risk is, you know, more than 1.8%, you're really an outlier almost <laughs> to your peers because, you know, of the ratings that are going on right now. So it's always surprising to me how hospitals are reporting these kind of data. And then vice versa, when you look at their public reporting, it's less than 1% of stroke. So somehow all the research patients have strokes, but not the clinical ones. So it's always interesting. Um, but those are just general comments of exclusion and, and risk factors. And I totally agree with everybody um, that we have to find a way of, of having a good conversation with folks to, so that they know what they're getting into before we you know, approve or, or disapprove in, in their conferences. Yeah, no, I definitely I agree. Definitely a lot to be learned here. So, did you have any questions? Yes, there is one. Um, excuse me, online question that came from Dr. Nicolai. And he asked, uh, should companies be looking towards a bicuspid specific valve? And if so, what shape should it be? Um, 
I think so. Yeah, I think they would. I think the Lotus valve actually did very well. You know, it's it's not approved anymore. Um, just the way it anchored. Uh, I think this shape should always still be circular, just to mimic uh, sort of best flow dynamics. But something which which has better anchoring properties uh, without causing trauma or obstructing the corners. It's it's a, it's, it's a tough. It's a tough, it's going to be a tough, uh, tough game there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do you, do you know anything about the calcification characteristics of the members of the or are just too few members? Like the valve? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's been looked at. And even if it has, I'm not sure if, if they've segregated the data like that. On the bicuspid side, it tends to be more fibrosis. That's why, yeah. yeah, that's why the calcium score tends to be lower relative to the same degree of your stenosis. Mm -hmm. um, and the bicuspids, depending on the age and everything, you know, sometimes you see that exuberant calcification of the non and then the rafe and, and all the leaflets, but uh, I don't think we have looked into women versus men. In our, in our experience, what percent, what is the breakdown of stenosis, would you say? The breakdown as far as outside cuspids are. How many are, are we doing cameras on? Well, it, it, it's men versus women. Oh, no oh, idea. Yeah. I don't know if it's just that you've done that. I, think, um, I, I think most of them have been men. There have been one or two women, and I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a big selection bias here. Um, so I, I'm not very sure. This is just in my fellowship this year. Yeah, they might go to surgery. That's the thing we don't know. I mean, as far as CT reading, you know, I've seen a few women. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.